welcome back to uh, episode two of the Great Pediatric Bake Off. We're joined by Camilla and Jonathan. Uh, so thank you both for agreeing to uh, bake with me. Um, I hope you're excited. Absolutely, yes. Ash. Can't yes. wait. <laughs> so do you, have either of you got any baking experience? Well, I've, I've taken to baking bread recently. Okay. I think that's a kind of lockdown thing, lots of people doing it. But um, my sourdough is um, a bit heavy, I think, but we do eat it. Sourdough is impressive. What about <laughs> you, Camilla? Can you bake? I, I, I like baking. I, 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 I like baking. I like any kind of cooking because I find it quite, you know, I don't want anyone else in the kitchen, put some music on, good, nice recipe, make something nice. I think I probably prefer savoury cooking to baking if I had to choose but yeah I quite like it, especially at the weekends when you've got time so that's mm. lovely yeah so we're yeah. gonna make some we're gonna make chocolate orange brownies today um, mm. so I'm hoping that your family and your teams will enjoy it okay so ovens are on ovens yep. are on yep okay and have you like have you got a have you got a tin have you got like a square tin yep and have you can you line it with baking paper Oh, right, okay. So, got a bowl. Yep. Got a small spoon and another bowl, a smaller bowl. Yep. Good. Some scales. Yep. Yep. Okay, and then have you got butter? Yep. Under, yep. Under butter, yep. And you've got some dark chocolate. Yep. And you've got yep. some orange chocolate, orange chocolate, quite a lot of it. A lot of it, yeah. yeah. Um, and then sugar, caster sugar. Yeah. Yep. Flour. Yep. Cocoa powder. Yep. Yep. An orange. Yes. And a sieve. And a, and a wooden spoon or a spatula to mix and an electric whisk. Got a cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I need that as well. So you've already put your oven on um, to 160 degrees fan. And you've lined your baking tray with some parchment paper. So the first thing we need to do is to melt. Out. Excellent. Um, is to melt the butter and the chocolate together. So you want 150 grams of dark chocolate and 150 grams of the Terry's chocolate. And then you want the butter. I think that's 200 grams, I believe. Yeah. So you want to get that all into a bowl. I'm going to have to produce something good because I have promised my team at work that they're going to have chocolate orange brownies tomorrow. So oh. I cannot afford a flop. You'll, you'll be one of the favourites on the neonate you know, tomorrow. <laughs> so many people are ill at the moment because there's so many bugs going around. And so we're always short of stuff. And so really, a few treats are... More important than ever at the moment, I think. Yeah, I agree. Everyone's got that melting. Yep. Yes, yeah, melting. Just keep an eye on it. Give it a little stir every now and then. This might take a little while for me. So, how are you both finding your new roles, Camilla? How's it going being the president? Well, um, it's been. Um, it's been really a remarkable few months. I, um, I always knew it was going to be uh, a lot to learn. Um, and I, there certainly is a lot to learn. But I've just been... There's so many fantastic people around. Hmm. And I've just had so many unexpected kind of conversations with people or received sort of nice emails. And as, as, as tough as... I know it is for everybody at the moment. There's still some absolutely brilliant colleagues out there. You know, for instance, we launched the strategy today and wow. I had a, te a text from somebody, you know, within an hour saying, just read it, looks great, well done, you know. And it, it's, it's interesting because those little kind of things really make a difference. Hmm. Um, and likewise, when we um, made our kind of uh, college, reached our college consensus position on the, COVID vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds um, somebody from outside London you know not somebody I actually work with just dropped me an email just to say 
I think you've done that brilliantly. Um, well done, you know. And it's little things like that that really make a difference. Um, and I've so I've really, really come to appreciate that because it is tough. And some of the some of the things we're doing, you know, you know, you're going to probably please, hopefully, the middle ground of pediatricians, but they're going to be people on either side who who aren't happy. And so, you know, accepting that they're going to be people who may be critical. Um, it's really nice when people send you little notes or or are appreciative. So yeah, I um, it's it's been a great. So I took over on the 10th of May, and here we are, end of September, and um, it's fabulous. Really, really good, actually. Great. And um, Jonathan, so obviously Camilla, you were in the um, in the committee before, um, but yeah. Jonathan, you're new. So how are you finding it? Yeah, well, I have taken over Camilla's role. Uh, well, previous role, the, the um, Vice President for Education and Professional Development. Um, and um, I feel I've got uh, big shoes to fill in, in uh, all that Camilla's done before. Um, and I guess I'm, I feel that because of the lockdown and so on, it, it's a bit harder to kind of throw yourself into it because, um, for instance, I've not actually visited the college in London yet. Mm. Um, and that was partly because uh, when, when we were just about to have some meeting there, then there were issues, I think, around the, the building. Anyway, so I haven't actually been. And I think that kind of helps you meet people and get to know people in a way that's just not possible on teams. Yeah. But on the other hand, I have, I've, I've really enjoyed getting to know so many people across the college. Uh, I think there's just amazing people both in the college and all the volunteers uh, of pediatricians who contribute in, in so many ways. So I feel on a, on a steep learning curve because, it, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't really been involved in anything that um, kind of got me into the middle of the college like, like this does. So uh, I feel I've got a lot to learn, but um, bit by bit, I'm getting there. Good, I'm glad. Um, I hope you guys get to meet face to face soon. <laughs> it's We're possible. Well, exactly. The building is going to be has, is being refurbished at the moment, and we're going to have a fantastic new members area, yes, I um, see. which is going to be really exciting. So for anybody who wants to come to the college, either to just do a bit of work between you know between meetings or wants to meet meet a, you know a, a, another pediatrician, we're going to have a lovely area on the ground floor, and we're going to have a brilliant area with coffee, good Wi-Fi, comfy chairs. And I'm hoping that you know, people are going to start using the building a bit more, um, obviously, as, as we start having a few more face-to-face -face meetings. So, Jonathan, when you, when you do come to London, hopefully you'll be able to kind of, between meetings, have somewhere nice to sit and you know, either meet, meet somebody else or just catch up on emails. Or, so it should be good. It does look a really, really good space uh, from the mock-ups I've seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's going to be and, and quite exciting. How's your chocolate coming along? Is it melting well? I think it's Mine's just about there, done. actually, Ash. Yeah. Mine's nearly there. I'm just mixing a little bit more. Can we take it off when it's all melted, or do you want yeah, to, yeah, you to leave it, it on? And leave it to cool on the side somewhere. Yeah, I think that's there. So we just do we just put it somewhere yeah. on the side? Yeah, just put it to the side. I think mine is also pretty much melted. If you're ready, then in your bowl... You need to put your eggs together, so three eggs, three large eggs, and 275 grams of castor sugar. So, Jonathan, I think I know that you've taken over Camilla's role um, with the conference. Yeah. And obviously, this, this year's conference um, was virtual completely. Um, and we had, I think, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure there was some very good feedback from it. Um, and one of the things that people really liked was being able to go back and watch um, certain parts again, or go, or be able to go to other sessions um, on another day or later on in the day because it was all all recorded, which was great for everybody's learning. Um, so I don't know what your plan is. Is next year planning to be face to face, or are we going to go hybrid? Um, what what, we, what have you got planned? Well, well, you're right that the feedback was really good for our online event. Um, and that's great. And the other thing about it was that it, it engaged people who maybe wouldn't have been able to come so easily, for instance, members from abroad. 
Um, so lots of good things about it. And like you say, there was a catch-up facility and, and, and so on. Um, I think when looking at the feedback, there's, there's sort of two views. Some pe people are saying, well, it's great to have this online and the access and so on. Other people are saying, well, um, it, it lacks the energy and the networking of a face-to-face -face event. Um, and and I, think, I think there's truth in both those and, and the whole conference team feel that. So it's then how do you uh, put those together? So we're exploring, can it be properly hybrid? Uh, or if not, is it better to, you know, I think we, it, we're clear we're gonna have a face-to-face -face event in Liverpool 28th to 30th of June, put in your diaries, be there, it'll be a great event. And, and it will have that energy and the, and the networking and, and so on that, that we've missed over these last uh, couple of years. So that's the kind of place we're at the moment. But I think basically we're interested in people's thoughts and feedback on, on all this. So um, to do, do let us know. I don't know, Camilla, Camilla was the organiser, the lead organiser for the conference. So uh, uh, maybe you've got views as well. I think it was a great job that the team did. I mean, the conference team did the most extraordinary job because, I mean, do you remember in 2020, we were we were going to go to Liverpool. I think it was Liverpool yeah, yeah. in 2020. And, I mean, we had the most extraordinary programme organised and then literally almost sort of at the 11th hour had to try and, well, cancel it and convert it to um, online. And the conference team was just brilliant. Yeah, everybody was bitterly disappointed and then everyone, you could see everyone just suddenly thought, no, we're not going to let this get, you know, we're, we've got too much good content here to let this get the better of us. We're going to see what we can move to online. And the team did a brilliant job. And then I thought they, again, did a fabulous job um, this year. But I, I, I sense people are so keen to get back together again. I, I would have... And there's something about the conference. Often, if you actually quizzed people about why they used to come to conference, it was almost as much for the content as it was for the networking, catching up with old friends. Yeah, I think that's important. And um, so I think, I think, Jonathan, you're right. I think aiming for in-person and if we can do some online streaming, brilliant, but... but make it in person I think particularly it'll it might it, it'll sort of signal hopefully the end of this really difficult time and the kind of start of something new the only the only I guess downside is that 20 percent of our membership are international and so they've really benefited by the online conferences and, and you know a small number did traditionally always come to the conference but they really were you know just tiny numbers um mm. and I think travel at the moment is quite unpredictable so you know, that, that's going to be a bit of a challenge. But then we have had our international conferences as well. We, you know, we had one in, well, it was meant to be in Singapore and it was virtually in Singapore. And um, Jonathan, we've got plans, haven't we, for more international conferences into the future. So, you know, we can do some nice things for our international members in addition to our national ones. Absolutely. Great. Right. So we do some mixing. Let's do some, mixing. yeah. So you need but, to do whisking, sorry, whisking. Um, and how do we know? How do we know when we've done enough whisking? Uh, on so you, this? You're gonna you're gonna whisk it until it's probably it's gone quite fluffy, and it's gonna be about double the size of what you've got at the moment. Okay. Um, and okay. it, basically, it basically looks like mousse texture almost, um, and so when you bring your whisk out, it should leave a little trail, um, and that's when you know that you've done enough whisking. Okay. Right, you're on. There you go. Start slow because otherwise it'll all go everywhere. And th this is just eggs and sugar, no flour here at the moment. Sugar, yeah. No flour yet. How are you getting on, Jonathan? Well, while he's whisking. <laughs> <laughs> So Camilla, I know that you, are you still um, helping on the um, equality, diversity and inclusion group? Oh, absolutely. Actually, that's a really good question. I do. And um, I think it's really, really important when it comes to EDI that actually senior leadership is involved. I think after the um, Black Lives Matter, George Floyd um, last, last death last summer, I think you know, every organisation on the planet started thinking about equality and diversity. 
a lot of good intentions have since kind of fizzled out. And and I think that's why it's so important to have, you know, it's, it's senior leadership really embedded in um, diversity and inclusion work if you really have an intention to make it stick, as it were. So I co-chair it with Rob Akunu, who's the Director of um, Policy and External Affairs. So we've got a, a senior staff member um, and a senior pediatrician co-chairing it. And, and that's really intentional uh, because I think there needs to be an intentionality about equality and diversity work. Um, you know, we have many pediatricians involved and we've got four work streams happening, you know, everything from advocating for children and young people to our staff to looking at volunteers within the college to the wider workforce and so on. So, um, and we've got some brilliant people um, involved who, I mean, meetings are absolutely brilliant um, because people are not shy to speak up. And I love that because actually we want people to hold us to account mm. and we want people to feel that they can say, but hang on, what about, or did you think about the EDI angle on such and such? Because actually there's so much of inclusion work is, you know, what you don't know, you don't see. And it's not that people are doing it, often not doing it intentionally. They just are, they, you know, a lot of this is unconscious. So actually, if we're really going to do justice to it, we have, you have to create a culture where people want to get involved, feel heard, feel free to speak up. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling optimistic, but it's, um, you know, it's something that we have to keep revisiting, keep thinking, are we still meeting the needs? You know, what are we missing? What could we be doing differently? Um, there's, a, there's still a lot of work, a lot of work to do. I know quite a few people who are on the EDI reference group and they're very passionate. Um, and actually, like you said, um, you, you know, when there's a, an, an acute moment or an acute story, there's a little bit of hype with it and then but it will die, it fizzle out or die down. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, those issues are really important and, and they really need tackling or addressing. And it's the sustained sort of um, work that we need to do to make sure that we're meeting those targets and making having, cha making changes as much yeah. as possible. Um, I attended the EDI group um, for the conference, and some of the some of the stories that you hear, and you know, I see quite a few on Twitter. They're just mm. absolutely shocking mm. um, and really disheartening. Um, there's a, there's a lot of equality inequality that we don't really we, we have well we don't talk about. Um, yes. People are afraid to talk about it or don't want to talk about it. And actually, it's really important to bring it out to the open and people to be aware of it, um, because that's the only way that we're going to make a change. I think that's right. And I'm sort of struck, even for groups that are being treated unequally, because so much of this behaviour has been sort of normalised. Mm. Actually, they, people are not even aware that they're being disadvantaged. Do you know, until somebody says, but hang on, why is it acceptable that you've been asked to do such and such, you know, as a woman or as a whatever? And then you suddenly go, oh, um, I hadn't thought of it like that. And, you know, you have your eyes open. You suddenly think, yes, why, am they, why are they expecting me to work like this? Or, you know, whatever. The, the, so it, it's interesting how so much of this is just entrenched into the way we, we live and work. And it's kind of been normalized. And it's, until someone calls it up, you suddenly think, oh, my word, I've never thought that that's, you know, that's an issue. So, um, you know, I, I think it was interesting because I was, I was nervous to begin with because I kind of thought, you know, personally, I feel like I could, I could make some awful mistakes. I could maybe use language inadvertently and unconsciously. Um, and we invited Professor Marla Rao, who is the, the medical director of the Medical Workforce Race Equality at NHS England, to come and join one of our early planning meetings. And I said this to her and she said, listen, nobody gets it right all the time. But the key thing is just get stuck in, just mm. get your hands dirty. And she said, you will make the odd mistake, but actually that's how you learn. And so I think very much having that kind of learning mindset for me is, is the way I see it. And I keep saying, you know, if, I, if I've done anything to kind of offend or unconsciously upset anybody, on any of these issues please just tell me because actually until you do I won't I won't know to do differently next time I think mm. that's probably true for all of us I don't know if you have any thoughts Jonathan at all I think it's as, as you said Ash that um the, the first step is is to bring it out into the open and be able to talk about it and to try and understand together why are things as they are and how should they be and how can we get there 
And and that's not necessarily an easy journey, but if, if we don't start by, by doing that mm. first step, we, we'll always be stuck at the beginning. So I, I just think it's fantastic that, it, that um, the college has started this work, is putting all the energy into it, has so many people contributing. Um, and, and the more all of us can feed into this process and, and see it as important and want to be the different kind of college or a, a different system really that people um, are part of, that also then informs societal change as well. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And I think actually talking to some of the other colleges where we've actually, we're quite a lot further than some of the others. Um, but, you know, we've got a lot of, for instance, you need data because you can't demonstrate change, I'm, I'm afraid, without having the data now to show that there's an improvement measured. So, for instance, things like differential attainment around exams, for instance. Um, it's about collecting really good data, designing some interventions to support improvement and then, you know, measuring your success. So that's going to take time and quite a lot of effort because actually collecting all this data um, is hard work. We've got to be committed and have a good structure. And actually, you know, it's front and central in the strategy now, equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, as I say, it's, it's now seen as core business. So, you know, I know it sounds really boring, but it's now properly budgeted for within the college um, because these things do cost, you know, staff resources and time. But I think you have to do that if you have a real intention to do this work properly. You can't just be relying on people's goodwill because that's what, you know, that's when these things just kind of fizzle out and you look back and think, oh, well, we sort of started it, but it never got momentum. Um, there's a real intention at the college. So that's the bit that excites me. Looking forward to it. Um, so we add the chocolate into the mousse. So I would add it onto, in, onto the side almost, and then you want to fold it in and keep the oh, So not, not, not whisk, not so, keep whisking. No. Fold it in, okay. Yeah. Can so I just check, Ash, my, my um, moussey thing is not, it's not got sort of peaks on it. Is that important? No, it doesn't need peaks. It just needs to be a bit of a trail, but that's fine. Okay. So, so maybe your chocolate mixture is cool, then I would just add it to the edges and then slowly fold it in. So you want to keep all that air in. Oh, right. Okay. Jonathan, I was thinking about the conference that we were talking about just now. And the other thing about the conference being in person that I think is so important is that for the foundation doctors and the medical students, you know, the people who haven't yet committed to paediatrics, I struggle to imagine how they're going to get the buzz of paediatrics on the, in the online conference. I've, and that's where I think we're going to benefit hugely by going back to in-person. We have, don't we have a student rate? I'm pretty sure anybody can come. I'm sure we have a student rate as well, so anybody can come, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, uh, it's great for students who are interested to, to submit uh, an application for the prize. Each school might do it slightly of differently. Yeah, I'd forgotten about the prize, actually. But yeah, it's a really good it's idea. One of, it's one of uh, many things, as you know, we have to, to encourage people to think about paediatrics and, and uh, come yeah. into it as a career. Um, I and I think that we do the same for foundation, don't we? Yes, I, certainly, I do. I certainly remember the um, the drinks reception that we have for the foundation doctors because that's always very well attended. Um, I think it's great. We, I think we really have to, particularly after the last couple of years where you know all our all our foundation doctors got deployed to adult services, didn't they? And possibly missed their paediatric placement. A lot of of the undergraduate clinical placements weren't quite the kind of usual. Um, experience. We've got to work even harder, I think, at the moment to keep attracting people into mm. the specialty. Because I think we, we had a problem at one point with trainee recruitment um, and we were, we were one of the, almost one of the worst specialties, which mm. was mm. Real, mm. Real, really disheartening to see at that time because, you know, so many of us love the, the speciality um, and I think it's even harder uh, you, to, to, to motivate these uh, medical students and foundation doctors who have just worked through COVID um, and been redeployed and they desperately want a break probably yeah, um, exactly. or, or thinking that hospital medicine is not for them um, and actually they're going to go towards more community services because as a result of it and I think it it's going to be quite a challenge to uh, sort of get recruit them into in, within the specialty so um, I don't I think it's going to be a difficult one. 
I don't know if you know yeah. that um, last last year was, I think, the first time ever we've had 100% fill rate uh, into SD recruitment at one to three. I think I'm right in saying, Camilla, which is... Yes, that's right. Brilliant. ...really wonderful for us. And I think yeah. that's te a testament to a lot of the hard work done by the uh, recruitment lifelong learning team. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was partly a campaign, but we're, we're moving now to an ongoing promotion of paediatrics in all sorts of ways that's been thought through quite carefully. Um, but I think in the end, it's up to each of us, wherever we are, mm. to, to be the model for people thinking, do I want to do paediatrics? We have to capture them early, uh, is what I've I've, no I've noticed. Um, like as soon as medic within medical school, I think mm. is um, to get their interest. And because people, quite a lot of people have made, sometimes made their minds up a little bit by the end of sort of F1, F2 or deciding that they want a year out. And I think we you really need, we need to target them almost as soon as possible. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and opening well, opportunities to them. And a lot of people come into medical school interested in paediatrics. So it's not like we've got a, a huge uphill struggle. It, it's mm. it's uh, then they hear about other things. And, and I think it's just keeping the, the message about what a wonderful career paediatrics is. Yeah, mm. yeah, I think that's right. But I think it's challenging, you know, when particularly, you know, if you think about how busy the services are at the moment, it's challenging to still have the energy to be selling it and role modeling the fact that it's a brilliant specialty you know, so I think we, I'm always conscious that, um, you know, the, equally the students need to understand that, you know, we are a front-facing clinical specialty. There's no getting away from the fact that, you know, um, there's a good proportion of out-of-hours work alongside kind of regular nine-to-five. You know, so they do need to see it, warts and all. But equally, I think if everyone's walking around looking miserable and sort of... Um, depressed about the future that's not great messaging um and I'm just conscious particularly at the moment people are you know I think everybody's tired people haven't had proper holidays for ages um we're worried about the winter winter seems to have started very early so I think we we we've we've got to try even harder um at the moment I think to just kind of keep the message as optimistic but balanced um, well, I think um, one thing I've always appreciated is that paediatricians are natural educators mm. uh, and true. En enthusiastic, committed educators. And, you know, it's not it's not hard to get people to, to join and d deliver the teaching we need from, from our undergraduate courses. And when I was convener of PEDSIG, you know, I met so many amazing people yes. just part of wanting to deliver really good education. And I think just that... Be you know, being the, especially where people who come in for their student uh, placements are, are noticed and valued and taught and looked after. Yeah. If we can just do that, that's a huge thing. It just uh, and um, I guess that that brought me into paediatrics when yeah. I, I remember placements where that happened. And um, so I think if we can do that as a as a specialty, but you're so right. You're so right. I mean, just just the way you said it then says it all. You don't actually have to do anything amazing or kind of heroic. It's just about valuing them, giving them a bit of time to teach, you know, so that they're not sort of shoved off into the corner and ignored in clinic or whatever it is, you know, come and have a look at these physical signs or, you know, let me, shall we have a conversation about, you know, whatever the condition is you're seeing, or do you want to go and take the history from the mum or, or whatever it is, those little things actually to a student mean a huge amount. So it's mm. not like you're having to do, you know, huge amounts to actually make them feel valued and welcomed and like this is an interesting and nice specialty, you know, to get involved in. Yeah, I agree. I, I think you remember the people as a medical student, particularly, and and how it feels to be on that placement, and that really motor really can change your perception of it. If you give them the time, if you show, you know, include them within the team, and if you know, if making them aware of the fact that it's a normal thing for you to have a coffee break at eleven every day, yes, or, to, yes, or to yes. or to call your consultants by their first name, which is like sometimes unheard of in other specialities. Mm. I think that all those little, little things will 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 drive them to think oh this is a really nice specialty to be and I, I need to look into it a bit more and then you you bring that motivation and you, hopefully you inspire them to to join us yeah that's right that's right 
let's add some flour and cocoa powder <laughs> and orange zest. And, and Ash, do we have to sift this? Or um, not? Ideally, yeah, I, I would sift it. Actually, I think these are going to be rather delicious. I'm not, I don't like chocolate orange at all. You know? um, no, I hate it. I don't know, there's something about it that just makes me feel like, ugh. But actually, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but I think this is going to be good. And did you say the oh. orange zest as well? Yeah, orange zest as well. And then you can fold it in again. So what, we, we um, put the zest into the flour and coconut? Yeah, yeah, into your... Have you, oh no! So you can you can sift uh, Jonathan the, the the flour you can sift into your bowl. Oh, into the mi mixture you mean? Into the mixture, yeah. And then okay. you can put you can um, grate the the zest into the mixture. Did you have a vision of Jonathan trying to sift the orange zest then? Yeah, that's I just I, ju I just caught him doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to do that. We we won't we won't tell anyone, Jonathan. It's all right. <laughs> And now we're just folding, are we? Yeah, fold, fold, fold around. Have you got any idea, Ash, um, how many people joined in with your with the Bake Off last time? I heard quite a lot. I did join in and um, I hadn't planned any of the ingredients. And it was only when I got halfway through, I realised I'd got no lemons. <laughs> <laughs> For a lemon drizzle cake. Yeah, so I did. I did an orange drizzle cake. Oh, that's all right. You're See. certainly getting a lot of people interested in your um, <coughs> recipe in milestones. Yes, which is great. How, how do you know that, Camilla? Oh, because I, I I can't tell you the number of people. You know that um, you know the birthday edition where there yeah, was that yeah. sort of rainbow cake. Oh yeah, yeah. The number of people who've told me they've made that cake, and in oh, fact, right. wasn't there there was a thing on Twitter, wasn't there? People yeah. showing their various cakes. I think Mike Farquhar even did a brilliant one. He did. He did a. He did a rainbow one. Amazing. I've just sent it the next recipe into the team. So, what for the winter edition? The winter edition, yes. Ah, I don't suppose you're allowed to tell us what it is. I, I don't see why not because I've put it on Twitter. So, <laughs> oh, did you? What is it? It's going to be cinnamon buns. Oh, oh nice. Yeah. Final thing to do is to put the chocolate chunks in, essentially. Ah, oh, right, and they need chopping. So they need chopping, ideally, or breaking down, shall we say. So we're really going to put two more chocolate oranges in here. <laughs> you, you put as much as you, no, you put as much as you want, Jonathan. And once it's all in, and yes, it goes into the mixture, essentially. Yeah, and then just tip it into the bowl, into the tray. Yeah, yeah. These are going to be so gooey. Yeah, that's the that's the key with a brownie. That has to be yeah. Good. Oh dear, spilling what chocolate happened? on the floor. <gasps> spilling chocolate on the floor—that's not a good yeah. thing. Oh dear, have you got a dog? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> that would be disastrous. <laughs> I thought Camilla thought that it's a handy way to clean it up. Clean <laughs> <laughs> I actually was thinking that, but you're right, dogs are not meant to have chocolate, are they? No. Well, these taste good, though. Mmm, don't they? I've literally so just like the rest of the, the goo. What yeah. was that last instruction, Ash? I think you were saying lick the bowl, weren't you, or something? Wasn't that your instruction? Yeah, lick the bowl. Mmm, <laughs> it's delicious. So I, I obviously bake um, to... To pass my time and maintain my own well-being. I'm, so, what what do you guys do to keep your well-being from work? I cycle to work, and as much as I groan and moan about it, especially when it's windy and it's raining, actually, I do find it incredibly helpful. Especially that cycle ride home in the evening. Mm. You know, when even if you've had a really bad day, there's just something about cycling home. By the time I get home, I I kind of feel I've put the world to right. Um, and then I don't know what else do I do. I, I I run at the weekends. I've taken to downloading a podcast first, and then running with a podcast. I'm really into Brené Brown's Dare to Lead series Are at you? the moment. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm Have you been listening book. to them? Well, I was listening, reading the book. I, I saw one of her TED talks. I thought it was very good. Mm. She's fabulous. But I really recommend Dare to Lead. Um, because oh, she, yeah. 
basically interviews just a series of really inspired, you know, interesting people um, on a whole range of topics. Uh, yeah, so I, 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 I'll download a podcast and go running. So that's what I tend to do when I'm not baking or cooking. What do you do, Jonathan? Uh, well, I enjoy music. I've been playing it in various ways. So I, I play piano and guitar. Um, oh, wow. Nice. And maybe and then, you can give us a little recital while, while the brownies uh, are cooking. It'd be perfect. Uh, no, perfect. Not, not recital standard, I hasten to add. But, uh, <laughs> the kind of private, um, you know, banging away on the on the piano mm, or the guitar. Lovely. It's nice. And uh, I, I think it's quite nice to um, book in things that make you do stuff. I booked uh, in a, an art class. Well, actually, my, my wife had booked me in as a, as a present, and it was really good. Um, just, just something completely different, you know. I went yeah. for several weeks, and I'm thinking it'd be good to do that again. Um, and uh, and then I, I, I had a sort of weights class I went on as well. Just um, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I'm going to keep going with that. But <laughs> <laughs> what not, weights? As quite, in this kind of these kind of well, weights? It was in the university. They were saying uh, what was it called? Strength, strength for life, I think. And they were oh, had some class to encourage people to to join. So. Uh, yeah, it was sort of lifting, lifting weights, and mm. it's not something I've ever done. Um, I wouldn't say it's my pastime to to uh, relax. <laughs> but I, I like cycling. Uh, I think it's a great thing to do cycling. So I did give up my parking permit on purpose to make me cycle in. Really? Wow. When you've got a, when you've got a permit in a car and it's a bit inclement weather, you, you mm. know it's just hard mm. to make yourself. So by giving up the permit, then that's clever. Yeah, that's would, really clever. That's a good way to do it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and then I've been trying to, um, well, I went on a cycle ride with, with some colleagues where I realised I was really unfit compared to, to them. We went up some hills in the Yorkshire Dales that were big hills, I thought, anyway. Mm. But So I, I'm, I'm trying to kind of practice the hills a bit. That's great. I've, I've only just learned to cycle, so this is my... Really? Yes. Wow. I, I learned in, like, April, something like that. Oh, Fantastic. As in to learn, so I love to spin. I go, I do a lot of spinning, mm. uh, and that's my detox or uh, away from work and to clear my mind. Um, but I've never been able to ride a bike outside or never learnt, shall we say? Um, and then I managed to learn to ride a bike in April, and so now I'm looking to purchase Amazing. my first bike. Amazing. So that I can you, you can you can get some really good deals with the cycle to work scheme. Yep, that's, that's how I got my bike recently. Yeah, that's what I'm planning to do as my first bike. So I'm getting a hybrid oh, bike fabulous. as my first one. You can yeah. put your you can put your bakes in, by the way. Oh, right, right. 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 You might as well put them in so that we can still chat. But uh, for how long, Ash? Uh, about thirty-five minutes. Okay. So I was asking you guys about uh, well, what you do got to do with well-being because I know that we've obviously gone through this pandemic and it's been quite hard. And I think well-being has become a really important subject um, within the world of medicine. Um, and I was just intrigued if there was anything that the college does um, to support the well-being of members because a lot, a lot of projects obviously happen locally but is there anything that we as a college should be having as a minimum for or suggesting to trust or to, to head of schools um, to support sort of trainees well-being? So, I mean that's a really interesting question and actually um, Dal Hofi who um, Ash, you might know she's a nephrologist at um, Great Ormond Street, but yeah. she's also our officer for lifelong careers. Um, she's doing some really great work trying to really understand the kind of lived reality of being a paediatrician. So this is not totally about well-being, but it's about the kind of how do you thrive in a career in paediatrics? Um, we've got some charity money to start the work, uh, to really do some focus groups, um, interviews and so on to really kind of understand across the whole career course you know what what are examples of great practice and then what are the other um, examples where things actually are not that good and she's going to use she's come up with this idea of almost using a, a GERFT like methodology so you'll remember GERFT stands for getting it right the first time so it's essentially a benchmarking methodology so if we can sort of work out what does good look like um, 
in a as for, as for a pediatrician be so it could be what does good look like for a pediatric trainee what does good look like for a um a pediatrician who's you know in their mid 50s and and you know within 10 years of retirement what does a mid career good look like and establish some sort of benchmarking then actually we're hoping that if, once we've kind of got it sort of really nicely kind of organized that pediatricians within their clinical teams could actually take this standard this benchmark to their head of service or their clinical lead to say actually look this is what the college recommends good looks like so what is you know what does good job planning look like what does good out of hours um sort of standards of working look like what does good look like for sort of older pediatricians who perhaps want to come off the out of hours work and develop their careers more around kind of daylight you know eight till six or um, work so and we're hoping that if we can establish some of those benchmarking tools that people will then be able to really use that as a as a kind of way of levering improvement in the workplace and, and I think that'll spill into well-being but it's really about you know we want people to feel that they can thrive across their, their whole careers um, so I think we're on quite an exciting journey there so I think you ask a really pertinent point mm-hmm. because I think it's, it's about thinking about the whole package um, so that people are free. You know, if you want to take up pottery, that actually you you have a, a kind of working job job plan that means that actually you can develop other aspects of your life rather than just being head down, um, you know, working yourself to a standstill and then reaching a point where actually you feel you just can't carry on and you either need a career break or, you know, lots of pediatrician, well, a significant um number of pediatricians sort of will retire early because actually it's just it's too much to keep working like that all the way to your mid 60s which is very sad because then we lose some of our most senior most experienced people when they're at their you know really contributing the most um you know to the rest of us so that's what i I, i'm excited so i think watch this space and we'll i think we're all going to learn a lot i think that yeah that brings on nicely to Jonathan because I think you all you have to you manage the pr- professional development of all pediatricians actually not just trainees um, so I think that will lead in very nicely to your role. It, it will and I think um, I, I think the work on lifelong careers is really vital and, and exciting um, and it, you know it relates to professional development because within that is is some of the sort of zing of, of medicine, finding out new stuff, um, learning with colleagues, changing your service so it's better because you, you've learned together. And so um, if we lose the education and the professional development, we lose so much depth and, and I, I go as far as to call it joy in, in paediatrics. Mm-hmm. Um, the work we're, look, we're looking at with lifelong careers also is kind of um, using a bit of what the uh, the document caring for doctors caring for patients um framework use the abc idea of the a being for autonomy and control we all need that autonomy and control to some degree in our lives and our our workplaces will be better for it if they can afford that to us and that includes trainees as well as uh, people establishing their um consultant or other careers and then b for belonging and i think that's a really key thing mm. how, how do each of us make our teams and our places Somewhere p- people, as they come in, feel they belong here. Because if you, if you feel you belong, I think you can start to thrive. Mm-hmm. And if you feel you're on the outside of it and you're not part of it, then, then it's very hard to thrive. And then the C for um, competence. And, and, and that's not just about achieving the competencies and showing them in assessments on, but it's about um, being asked to do the job that you can do and not, and not beyond it and not be... Yeah. stretched and because of gaps or whatever you know so and, and there's there's finding what what works for each individual in in this as well as as um, Camilla was saying and that's for trainees as well as consultants yeah lots of lots of uh thinking actually that was, I really like that I think if you I think if you make people belong within a team they're much more likely to stay and and our retention and things will be a lot higher and We'll be able to recruit more so it all filters down into all of the things yeah. that we've been talking about and i mean you know and that's that's and that's why I, i'm so excited about a groups like soft landings for instance mm. you know because our international medical graduates 
um, are such an important part of the workforce. And yet they've got a whole separate set of challenges, you know, in coming from another country, learning about the NHS, often separated from their families. You know, they've got the whole kind of getting to, to understand culture within, you know, Great Britain, never mind the, the place of work. And so, you know, a, a group like Soft Landings for me just, I, I can't describe to you, I'm so excited about them because just organically from a group of international pediatric trainees themselves as groups developed um, and they understand better than anybody what IMGs need. And, and I think that's the most fantastic example of, of when you allow, you know, when a, when a group really understands issues and, and then sort of comes together with a kind of commitment to in, improving the kind of quality of people's working lives. Um, I look at the programs that they put together, you know, be it interview practice or induction into the NHS, and they're just so on the button because, of course, they've lived through it themselves. Uh, so they totally know what an international medical graduate needs. So I, you know, I find soft landings are just a remarkable group. And, and the more we have of those kind of ideas, the better we're all going to be. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you're totally right. The soft team soft landing is incredible. Fantastic. It's such, such a great resource for IMG trainees. Mm. Something that, you know, we've not had it and suddenly it's been there. And they're such a vulnerable group. And I think yeah. we recognise that they're a vulnerable group within our workforce and they need support and they need a completely different tailored approach, actually. Um, so it's great. And, you know, I know our um, team soft landing um, rep for the West Midlands and she's fantastic. So yeah, um, I, bet. I know I, we've got plans to, uh, to try and support it within our region. So I do a lot of simulation work and I think we're planning to do sort of an IMG simulation day to support the tra- specifically support IMG trainees coming into into UK medicine um, and specifically into pediatrics. Um, so I'm really excited actually. Yeah. That our sim fellow doing that so that'll be exciting brilliant brilliant idea and i think as a college we absolutely get that as part of our role and responsibility and i think that's why it's so important the img work the edi work it's so important because of what our workforce is yeah. um, how diverse it is and i think we should be really proud of that yeah i think that's right i think absolutely so it's a nice so example well, of um of a uh, a group identifying an issue and coming up with some solutions that work really well. And then the college, uh, coming to the college and, and getting support from the college to, to help make it work. And um, I'm sure there's many other examples of that kind of thing happening. But I guess it, it illustrates the point of, of the college being for, we are all our members, you know. Yeah. And, and the more we're all uh, contributing those kind of ideas and um, things that make the difference. The better because I don't know about you Jonathan sometimes people say to me so what's the college going to do about such and such and of course the college absolutely has responsibilities um, to do all, all, all sorts of things but you see team soft landings is a perfect example actually they came together they've created something they didn't they didn't need to worry about what our kind of kind of expectations perhaps even rules within the college were They've completely done it the way they wanted to do it. And we can support them, but they're still free to develop absolutely anything that they think is appropriate. And I love that kind of way of working, you know, where the college can support, um, kind of encourage, share resources, but let our members actually come up with some of these ideas and, you know, and initiatives. I think Mm. I'm sure that's a richer way of, and we're more likely to develop things that meet their purpose that you know sort of achieve the goal because they've kind of come from the people that you know realize the need Mm. I I quite like that model of working rather than the kind of top down you know we'll do it for you kind of approach which often doesn't he sort of misses the point perhaps and doesn't land quite so well so I think team soft landings is the most brilliant example and we need to encourage more of that kind of thing I think I've just been realising this is a slightly dangerous thing to do because um, uh, I've been licking my chocolate bowl and then <laughs> and then appeared on the uh, on the video without checking. So I think I think I'm all right. But <laughs> Jonathan, we were too embarrassed, Jonathan, to tell you that you've got cocoa on your nose. We thought Am I still big comic value. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a sort of classic thing, isn't it, when you're cooking? Do you want to check your bakes and see if they're? Oh yeah. 
Oh, how would we? Know, how would we know? Put a skewer. So put a skewer or your thermometer through, and if it comes out fairly dry, then it's done. Fairly dry, but we don't. We don't want it crumbly, do we? No, because you want it a little bit gooey. You see, mine's all cracking around the edges. Mine's quite liquid. Yeah, then it needs longer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It might take up to an hour. Oh my God! You're yeah. joking. Well, but you don't. Think, you don't want it. I think you get the look. It looks very nice, even if it's still liquid inside. So, um, there we are. We just, should we just pretend it's done? Yes. But you can, yeah, you can see there's some movement underneath. So I think, um, but yes, I'll put it back in. Yes. Brilliant. Or am, I, am I meant to be pretending it's finished? We're meant to be pretending it's done. I think. <laughs> yeah, that's us pretending it's done. Okay. Oh, I, I, I think a bit of realism is all right. We don't have to have completed. <laughs> no, exactly. We don't want people uh, to be pushed off and think we're sort of Nigella-like. I don't, I don't think we should yeah, fool, fool people with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. if, well, it's edible, if it's edible at the end, I'll be pleased. Oh, Thank well, you. this has been a lovely interlude. This Thank is very you. therapeutic, isn't it? it Talking is very and therapeutic. cooking and... Yeah. yeah, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, that's great. So actually, Jonathan, are you inspired for, for Liverpool Conference? Got to get some baking. Yeah, well, we'll put it on the agenda, see what we've <laughs> <Brilliant. you've> done. <laughs> can't, I can't make Excellent. a promise. but <laughs> Brilliant, Ash. You've been right. a star. Thank no, you so much yeah. for um, coaching us through that. That's okay. Having a Thank good you chat you at the same for, time. For it's a great content. Loads to chat about. Brilliant. Thank you. Yes, yes of the um, chocolate orange brownies. Um, well, yeah. Are you go, okay, Cal? Yes, yeah, sure. They certainly look good. And um, you can be honest. We'll be honest. <laughs> this is a socially distanced testing, tasting. Look at Cal's face. It's very serious. <laughs> uh, I can't remember the last time I had something like this, you know. Does that mean it's good or bad? It's yummy, that's what my tongue says. Yummy. yummy. <laughs> Brilliant. A good, a good crunch, a good density, perfect brownie, I'd say. Oh, it's very nice. Any good? Mmm. It's lovely. Mm. What is it? Orange juice. Mm. Oh. Thumbs up from the team.